simple question. How many of you have watched The Gilded Age? Raise your hand. Okay, pretty good. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, how many of you thought Downton Abbey was better? Raise your hand. Well, uh, you know, the, the truth is trying to capture that period in time is difficult because it's such, it's so hard to believe what, what actually happened. Uh, so the person that gave that era its name, The Gilded Age, was none other than Mark Twain. Uh, in his book, The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today, as he said. Um, and he satirized it as an area glittering on the surface, but corrupt underneath. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, um, I wasn't worth a penny two years ago, and now I owe $2 million. So it, it began in the 1870s uh, and ran through the turn of the century. Uh, it was defined by this battle uh, between uh, monopolies and labor between big business and industrial tycoons and titans and the working man. Uh, I, I love this cartoon. I'm going to use a lot of cartoons today to sort of illustrate what was going on. Um, I think it ends around 1902, 1904, uh, when uh, Teddy Roosevelt starts the trust busting. Some people put it going all the way to World War I. Some people end it in 1900. But it's a period of time where you have this sort of outrageous growth in the wealth of the upper class. Um, and I think one of the things that defines that um, is how they did it and what was happening in this post-Civil War period that allowed them to accumulate this massive wealth and how that this arc, Gilded Age, Roaring Twenties, Great Depression, leads to everything that Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt then do and why they were able to be successful. Um, so uh, it was the, the Gilded Age was the age of uh, greed and guile, of rapacious robber barons, unscrupulous speculators, corporate scoundrels, shady business practices protected by scandal-plagued politicians, and a vulgar display of wealth amidst shocking poverty and widespread hunger. Now these are sort of typical of the kind of political cartoons of the day. You see the big fat cats on top, and on the bottom you see, I don't know if you can read it, it says linen workers average $11 a week, lumber workers $6 a week. Um, meanwhile, you know, the robber barons are making literally millions of dollars a year. So there was this extraordinary income inequality. Um, it's one of the most uh, brazen figures during this period is John D. Rockefeller, you've all heard of the Rockefellers. He created the Standard Oil Company. Uh, which quickly became one of the largest oil companies and one of the biggest companies in the world and turned Nelson, I mean, turned uh, John D. Rockefeller into um, arguably the richest American who ever lived and certainly one of the richest non-royalties who ever lived. Um, he used ruthless tactics to consolidate power, but they found themselves up against sort of state laws that would restrict the size of their companies. Uh, so on January 1st, 1982, he created, he secretly created Standard Oil Trust. This was the first of the big trusts where you bring a bunch of little companies together, you bundle them, and you have a small group of people who control them, hence creating a monopoly that could control prices, that could control distribution, et cetera. And what's interesting thing about the date of that uh, is that January 1982, 1882 is also the month that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born. And um, this is the earliest known picture we have of him. It's a little fuzzy. Uh, so his life really does literally track with the transformation from the Gilded Age to the Great Depression. 20 years later, after his birth, his cousin Teddy would, of course, take down Standard Oil Company. Gilded Age was formative for American for a number of reasons. It, it, it sort of was this moment of creation for modern America. Uh, when Jefferson's vision of this sort of family-run agrarian society was finally overtaken by Hamilton's vision uh, of an urban industrial society controlled by bankers and investors. Uh, and the great debate between the two founding fathers, Hamilton won. I'm, I'm going to do some graphs tonight, and some of the numbers don't really add up because it's so hard to correlate between what a dollar was worth in 1870 and what a dollar is worth today, but we'll do our best. So the percentage of wealth owned by the top 1% uh, 
reached about 45% in this period, if you see the graph there. Um, so 45% of all wealth in America was owned by 1% of the people. Um, and the top 9% held 75% of all the wealth in America. Uh, the Gilded Age is best known for the extravagant lifestyles of these robber barons. Um, and, and of course, there many of these palaces still exist and they've become great tourist attractions. So who were these titans of industry? This is one of the many mansions built by Cornelius Vanderbilt and his various uh, ancestors. Now, he made his fortune in railroads and shipping. And if you know the the Vanderbilt story, you know, he started literally shuttling people across from Staten Island to Manhattan in a sailboat um, and turned it into the, one of the most uh, incredible, uh, large, profitable companies in the world. Uh, he left in a state of $100 million, which today is considered um, $3 billion. But again, this is where the numbers don't make any sense, because uh, if you look at his wealth as a percentage of the gross domestic product, in other words, how important was he relative to the whole country, his estate would have been $200 billion. So, you know, you're talking Elon Musk, you know, level wealth. Andrew Carnegie, um, he built the U.S. steel industry, uh, and he amassed an extraordinary amount of wealth, uh, then gave most of it away. He was sort of the quintessential, the archetype of the philanthropist Robert Barron, who felt so guilty about what he had done that he spent the end of his life giving all his money away. Uh, he gave away um, $350 million, again, this is turn of the century, um, to uh, various charities um, towards the end of his life. And of course, there are the Astors. I have a personal fondness for the Astors. Um, uh, John Jacob Astor IV on the right, uh, he was a real estate developer and investor, owned large portions of Manhattan, and of course famously died on the Titanic. And when he died, he left his estate to his only son, Vincent, um, on the left there, who was only 20 years old at the time. Uh, it was an estate worth probably three or four billion dollars today, again, depending on how you calculate the numbers um, as a percentage of a gross domestic product, again, probably more like $150 billion. Now, the Astors and the Roosevelts were close personal family members. Um, this is Vincent on the right, FDR on the left, with FDR's two grandkids on uh, Vincent's 265-foot private yacht, the largest private yacht in the world at the time, the Norma Hall. Um, and uh, FDR's older half-brother, Rosie Roosevelt, was married to Vincent's aunt, who was John Jacob Astor the fourth's wife, and Rosie Roosevelt was the executor of John Jacob Astor's estate, which of course went to Vincent. That's how close they were. They also lived together, uh, lived near each other up on the Hudson River, um, and in Vincent Astor's home in the basement, there was a shooting range uh, that Eleanor Roosevelt used to go up to and shoot in, and also contained the first heated swimming pool in America, which FDR would use after he got polio uh, to do the water exercises that he did uh, as part of his recovery. So the families were close. So Vincent was the grandson. Anybody know who this is? Caroline Shermerhorn Astor, the famous Mrs. Astor. Uh, and for those of you who've watched The Gilded Age, you know they reference her all the time because she controlled um, the social elite in New York, in Manhattan. Some would say she controlled it with ruthless superiority. Uh, and she was the one responsible for creating this list of 400, uh, because allegedly 400 people could fit in her ballroom. Uh, so when she would have these glamorous balls, if you were on her list, you got invited. And if you were not on her list, as Mrs. Russell often wasn't in the TV series, then you were not invited to her parties. Um, but there was more to it than just that. There was a um, sense that these were the real Americans. These weren't the nouveau riche. These were people who could trace their families back to the Revolutionary War, to the Mayflower. And so they were real Americans, sound familiar? Uh, and, and they were dis discriminatory in their um, sense of who belonged in their group. But of course, during this time, um, there were millions of people who were living in tenements. And couldn't 
you know, in the shadow of these gilded mansions. Um, because this was a period uh, where um, the average worker uh, earned at most a few hundred dollars a year. So Ellis Island Station uh, opened on January 1st. How many people have been to Ellis Island? It, it, this is a, a building that burned down. But it's an incredible place to go and visit and to really understand the influx of immigration into this country. Um, and during this period, um, you know, on its first day of opening in 1892, um, uh, the month FDR turned 10, uh, 700 migrants passed through uh, that on that first day. Uh, 400,000 the first year, and within five years, about 1.5 million immigrants were processed through Ellis Island. Uh, and what makes it very interesting is that, of course, many of them uh, didn't speak English, were, were essentially penniless as they arrived, and many of them actually went up the Hudson River to what was known as the Queen City at the time, Poughkeepsie, which is right next to Hyde Park where FDR grew up, because it was a major industrial site on the river and they were constantly hiring um, immigrants. And it's very interesting when you look at the history of Poughkeepsie, they go from discriminating against uh, the Germans to discriminating against the Irish to discriminating against the Italians to discriminating against uh, Hispanics. So it, it's a long history of discrimination. So around the turn of the century, the nature of, this Im of these immigrants changed dramatically um, because instead of people immigrating from Britain or Germany or Ireland or Scandinavia, now they were coming from Hungary and Italy and Poland and Russia. Uh, the newcomers were mostly Catholic or Jewish. Um, and, you know, two thirds of them settled in major cities. Desperate for work, uh, they um, would, would, were forced into these almost slave labor-like um, workshops. They clustered in ghettos, earned low wages, uh, and of course, the, the profits that the tycoons were able to generate because they weren't paying their workers very much were enormous. Uh, young women were forced to work 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, this is a photograph of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Does anybody know about that? Of course you do. So when a fire broke out here, they locked the doors when the women were working so that they couldn't leave the premises. And when a fire broke out, 146 workers 123 women and 23 men were killed uh, in this terrible fire. And this was one of the impetuses for labor um, unions and for this transition into a more uh, just working environment for people. Um, the tragedy de occurred despite the fact that Congress had passed a law, a bill, 10 years earlier trying to prevent this exact thing. It was called the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, and I love this cartoon, you know, it looks like, I don't know, a newspaper with a necktie, I'm not sure. Um, but the idea of the Sherman Antitrust Act uh, was that it would prevent robber barons from this consolidation, from creating these monopolies. Um, but it was absolutely useless because Congress wouldn't enforce it. Um, and but the same industrialists, I really love this cartoon. The same industrialists uh, that it was designed to control actually controlled the Senate. So you can see the guy, the fat guys in the back, and if you can read it, the Steel Trust, the Copper Trust, the Standard Oil Trust, and at the bottom it says the bosses of the Senate. Um, and so this is sort of the problem: is you've got these tycoons. They have so much money, they have so much control. They literally buy senators, um, and you know back then, of course, also senators were. Um, appointed by state legislatures uh, rather than elected by the public. So it was really easy to manipulate um, the state legislatures to get the people that they wanted in office. Um, so then um, when J.P. Morgan, uh, who was one of the richest men in America, uh, mostly from banks and things, uh, decided to take the Great Northern Railroad and bring all the railroads together, but essentially buy up all of the railroads across the country and create a monopoly for transcontinental train shipping. This was a huge, powerful lobby. Um, and because they controlled all of the different trains, and back then there were multiple trains running everywhere, they could set the prices. Uh, and they could give favorable prices to their companies 
and they could jack the prices up for the smaller shippers. Um, and so, um, despite the fact that this was a clear violation of the Sherman Trust Act, President McKinley wouldn't do anything about it. But then, of course, President McKinley dies, and his vice president takes over, and there's a new sheriff in town named Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and he comes in, even though he's a Republican, and part of this, you know, they say fair philosophy, he immediately goes after these trusts and says this is wrong uh, and sixes DOJ on them and wins uh, the case against uh, J.P. Morgan with the railroads um, and then takes on Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller. I love the faces here. You know, that's uh, it's, uh, Morgan on the left and J.D. Rockefeller with that sort of evil serpentine face at the top. Um, the in, if you can't read the bottom, it says the infant Hercules and the standard oil serpents. You gotta love these cartoons. Come on, right? They, they, they're great. So um, FDR was in college at this point. So this is 1902, 1904. He bring, Teddy brings the case in 1902. The Supreme Court rules in 1904. This is right as FDR is graduating from college. And FDR is absolutely enamored with his cousin Teddy uh, and decides he's going to follow in Teddy's footsteps. Um, and at, at exactly the same time, Teddy's niece, um, Eleanor, is, has come back from her overseas education and has gone through the sort of debutante coming out. And she joined something called the Junior League, uh, which in those days was a do good organization without being ironic. Um, she began working with immigrant children in the settlement houses. This is the uh, Riverton Seven uh, Settlement House that she worked at. Uh, and she taught uh, the children of these immigrants how to read, how to dance, how to do calisthenics. She was sort of trying to ingrain into them some of the American social and cultural norms that would be important for them to succeed as they went forward in life. Um, so when she brought her new um, Bo, her fiance, a guy named Franklin, uh, to visit the um, settlement house, he was shocked. He couldn't believe that anyone could live in these sort of horrible conditions. Um, and this is the first sort of step on this great political partnership that the two of them formed about this is wrong. How can we fix this? How can we make this better? It's not right that we have 10 people living in a one room apartment with no hot water no heat, no electricity, when the Astors live right up the street in a $100 million mansion. So this idea that um, how do you change the economic system um, when the great industrialists like Rockefeller and Henry Ford reap these huge profits. Um, now, the labor unions started to gain power here, and uh, something called the Interstate Commerce um, Act, which actually I won't bore you with it, but it's really important because it ended this discrimination that railroads were doing against small producers. It said, you can't do that. You can't charge the person here who's really rich less than you charge the person over here who's really poor, right? You got to charge them the same amount, uh, among many other things that the Commerce Department did. And so there, there was a social movement now that was trying to rein in um, these robber barons. So with Europe, so 1914, World War I erupts in Europe. Um, and in the beginning, of course, America's neutral. So they're selling food and guns and gas to both sides, and people are getting really rich uh, because we are the only sort of industrialized country um, that has no war damage and isn't sending all of their bullion to fight this war. Um, and in this process, um, the... The United States doesn't really get involved until 1917. Um, and so there's this boom in American farming, particularly to provide food. And actually, this is the period where Herbert Hoover rises to global um, fame because he organizes a food relief program for the Belgians because millions of Belgians were starving. Because you know, you know the story of World War I. Most of World War I is fought in Belgium. Um, so the, all their farms were destroyed. They had no stores. They had nothing so that uh, Hoover, Hoover raised the money to feed these Belgians. And they, he became known as this sort of great humanitarian and very, very organized person. 
didn't do him much good later, but at the time he was very well respected. So during this period, you know, the Homesteading Act had opened up huge parts of America to farmers. Um, and so they went out and now all of a sudden you could make a lot of money selling wheat and corn uh, to the Europeans. So they plowed under huge sections of the prairie. Um, and of course, when the war ended and the demand dropped and the prices dropped, they had torn up the prairie without doing any sort of soil conservation. And this led directly 10 years later to the Dust Bowl. Uh, so they were literally planting the seeds of their own destruction. Um, so the war ends 11 a.m., 11th day, 11th month, 1918. And there's great celebration around the world. But the Versailles Treaty creates these incredibly punitive um, restrictions on Germany. And England and France are in enormous debt, mostly to the United States. Um, and this sort of is like a cancer that grows on the global economy, which again leads to the collapse and the Great Depression. Um, but within a few years of the end of the war, there's this sort of revitalization. Everybody says, war's over, let's have fun. And hence the Roaring Twenties, also known as the Jazz Age. Um, and you're supposed to do it like this with your hands, the Jazz Age. Um, the, it was a period of explosive economic growth um, and prosperity with this sort of progressive cultural edge. Uh, urbanization for the first time uh, reached a, a milestone in that there are more people living in urban areas than rural areas for the first time in American history. Jazz blossomed with new generation of performers like Duke Ellington um, and the, the, the great Harlem Renaissance came about during this period. You got a black middle class emerging um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way, um, overcoming you know, widespread racism and discrimination. Um, but there was a, a sense that there was this forward motion. Society was moving in a more liberal, progressive way. Uh, nightclubs, vaudeville, glamorous performers. It promoted a promiscuous lifestyle uh, with the devil may care attitude about traditional values. The flapper, I love the picture on the left there. Uh, so the flapper became this new, the modern look of the European and the American woman. Uh, and, and many old mores and gender stereotypes uh, were cast aside in favor of this more liberated role for women. Uh, they had just won the right to vote, 1920. So all of a sudden they had political power uh, as well as a, an ability to express themselves in a way that they had never had before. This is Coco Chanel, who is a fascinating, you could, you could do a whole hour on her easily, because uh, she really redefined the fashion for women. She invented the little black dress. She's the one that convinced women they could wear pants. Um, you know, she was a, a very, very progressive um, leader through the fashion industry in changing social behaviors. Eleanor Roosevelt during this period uh, was very, became very politically active. Uh, she was not a flapper, as you could well imagine. Um, and she really got deeply involved with uh, the Democratic Women's uh, Committee in New York with the League of Women Voters. Um, she was, you could see her out in the street. She was always sort of trying to generate uh, political consciousness on the part of women. You have this new political power, you have to use it. Uh, if women could, just be more politically active. They can change a lot of these problems that our society uh, has to deal with because most of those problems are caused by these damn men. <clears throat> I include myself in that category. Franklin Roosevelt began the Roaring Twenties running as the vice president uh, with um, um, James Cox uh, and they lost. Uh, but uh, it sort of launched FDR on a political trajectory that seemed to say he's going to be the presidential candidate probably in 1924. Again, this is one of these great photographs where you see him prior to polio. Um, and you can see he's this sort of tall, athletic, good looking man with the incredible charisma. Um, and, you know, it seemed like the future was bright uh, for, for FDR. Um, he believed in Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations. Uh, he was a big believer in a strong Navy and military. Uh, he had, you know, a lot of ideas on what he'd just been 
Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Wilson, following in his cousin Teddy's footsteps. Um, and then in 1921, uh, he was stricken with polio. And I'm sorry, I know this is a Getty's images. Um, it's the only one I can find from this period where he's on crutches. Uh, the family took great lengths to um, control the images of him. They downplayed the severity of his illness, um, but he still essentially disappeared for most of the Roaring Twenties. Uh, here he is swimming in the uh, pool at the Warm Springs uh, Rehabilitation Center that he uh, ended up buying and transforming into the world's premier polio rehabilitation center. But he essentially sort of disappeared from the political scene during this period. Um, in his time in Georgia, he was exposed uh, to this sort of abject poverty um, of the sharecroppers and the tenant farmers and the sort of Jim Crow laws uh, controlling the South. And it was so offensive that Eleanor didn't like to go to Warm Springs. She wouldn't even go with him after the first or second time, or she would rarely go. And if she did go, she would only stay for a day or so because she found the whole situation so upsetting. Um, but I think it was one of those things that between his polio and the growth of his empathy and his sympathy for people who were struggling and seeing this kind of almost incomprehensible poverty really made him commit himself to trying to find a way to help these people. And again, this is an undercurrent. This is part of the foundation of what he would do later uh, with the New Deal. So the 18th Amendment prohibition also was passed right around this time. And of course, it's what gives the Roaring Twenties its name of the Roaring Twenties, because with the um, outlaw of the sale of alcohol, all of a sudden you have speakeasies like this. Um, you have bootleggers, uh, you know, creating uh, booze in the back country and then smuggling it into big cities and small towns and willing to fight the feds, the revenuers, as they were called, who were trying to shut them down. Uh, there was a, a, a component of, of serious civil unrest here in that huge portions of the population of the United States just ignored and violated the, the, the prohibition laws. Um, so you had a destabilizing of the of stable social fabric where people would respect the rule of law because <laughs> they wanted to drink. Um, and of course, this, these bootleggers and all of this um, illegal money funded the gangs. This is fam Al Ponce uh, Capone, uh, Scarface there, and one of the picture on the right you can see with his scar. Um, and these gangs took over the cities and generated, again, enormous wealth to buy politicians and undermined the rule of law um, in, in many urban areas. And this was part of the sort of Roaring Twenties idea, which was that, you know, you can go to a speakeasy, you can have fun, you can dance, doesn't matter, it's against the law because we're having fun. So the Roaring Twenties also saw these incredible advancements in technology. Uh, airplanes, for example, all of a sudden, the planes that were sort of developed in World War I uh, started getting used. This is for the Desiree News. They would deliver newspapers to farmers around the state um, using an airplane. Um, it was also good advertising. Uh, the Roaring Twenties saw remarkable developments in automobile industry. This is a, a, a Ford Model T uh, from 1925. Uh, and this is a 1927 Mercedes turbocharged Type S. Um, and then, of course, this is uh, Great Gatsby's Yellow Rolls Royce. So if there's anything that sort of personifies the transition from the Gilded Age to the Roaring Twenties, it's the Great Gatsby. Um, and this is a, a book that really sort of um, attempts to discredit while glamorizing the role of these um, extremely wealthy people. Um, and this was a period where literature was very important, you know, and there were a lot of great books during this period. Sinclair Lewis's Babbitt and, you know, The Man in the Gray Suit, Edith Wharton, The Age of Innocence, Ernest Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises. And if any of you've read The Sun Also Rises, you know, this is sort of the introduction, the concept of this lost generation that the people that survived World War I were so sort of cynical about life um, that they didn't care. You know, they were this lost generation. 
they were also uh, uh, blossoming this black renaissance um, of, of black writers. Um, you know, this is Zora Neale Hurston on the left and Langston Hughes on the right. Um, and of course, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a philosopher, a politician, a writer, a teacher. Um, he was probably the most important black voice in this first half of the 20th century. Um, and these voices were really starting to have an impact on the white intelligentsia. Uh, for the first time, they were being taken seriously as artists, as, as teachers, as leaders. Um, and it was really uh, an important moment. However, um, electricity was really the big deal. Uh, so this is Schneider's, um, was this? Yeah, this is Schneider's uh, showroom in Washington, D.C., uh, showing off in, in the mid uh, 1920s, showing off all the new uh, electric labor saving devices. I love this picture. I'm not sure why you can't really see all the details, but there's little vacuum cleaners and heaters and lamps and dishwashers and refrigerators over on the side there. And, um, you know, it's just like the explosion. If you were a have, you could afford these things. But of course, most people in America couldn't. And if you lived in the rural areas, you lived on a farm, you weren't going to see electricity for another 30 years. Um, but this was part of this of this period of a technological advancement. Movies became hugely important. Um, and you had millions of people going to motion pictures, and you had the transition from silent to talkies. Um, and in the summertime, movie theaters were air conditioned, which is no small deal. I don't know if you can read it here. Uh, it says, um, uh, what do you, can you just see it? Refrigerated, uh, that, that, that little sign across the matter, re refrigerated uh, seats or something, you know, because it was cool inside. You had these famous movie stars, Lillian Gish and Rudolph Valentino, uh, who became just uh, icons in American society. Um, you also had this massive change in music, uh, the phonograph and the recordings, and you had radio. And radio changed so much because you suddenly had instantaneous communication. Uh, you also had, you know, an outlet for musical performances. Uh, and it was particularly significant. 1920, uh, KDKA, a uh, radio station in Pittsburgh, is the first radio station to broadcast the results of a presidential election. Um, and that was only a few people heard it, but it was the start of this exponential growth of radio and the importance that it had. So the 1920 election, that's Harding on the right. Uh, he wins. Uh, he introduces 12 years of Republican leadership, um, uh, he's followed by Coolidge and then Hoover. Um, Harding um, was very popular despite the fact of the Teapot Dome scandal. You probably heard about the Teapot Dome scandal. You know, his members of his cabinet were illegally selling part of the U.S. oil reserve. It's more complicated story than that, but we'll just say it was bad. But he dies, uh, and Coolidge takes over. Coolidge was the vice president. Then Coolidge gets reelected in 24, and then Hoover gets elected in 28. So you have this string of Republican presidents who believed in laissez-faire. You know, government's job is not to get involved with business, let them do whatever they want, stay out of their way. Uh, and it's also not our job to help people who are poor and starving. Um, so this 12-year this period enormously benefited the, the wealthy, it allowed um, unchecked growth on the stock market. Uh, so there was no controls. You could tell somebody, hey, I've got a great company here. You know, it's worth $20 million. Why don't you give me some money? The company could be worth nothing. And there's nobody to hold you accountable once you sell those stocks. Um, so it was a time when, again, you were laying the foundation for the Great Depression because of the lack of regulation for these banking. So a bank could take your money and invest it in a bad stock, and there's nothing you could do about it if the bank lost the money. Perhaps no invention changed the period. The telephone became, uh, it had been invented many years earlier, but it became this everyday tool. Can you imagine, you know, living in a time when you couldn't just call somebody up, you know, on your phone? Uh, there were new types of printing presses, so newspapers and magazines became wildly popular and successful. And nothing drove circulation more than celebrity. And there was no bigger celebrity than Babe Ruth. I love the Bambino, the Colossus of Swat, the Sultan of Swat, the Behemoth of Bust. He had a lot of names. 
Um, and he sold newspapers. And probably the only person in the world who was more famous, certainly the only person in America who was more famous than Babe Ruth, was Charles, oops, Babe Ruth, one of our great Babe Ruth players, only person more famous than Babe Ruth, Charles Lindbergh. Um, and his solo flight across the Atlantic sort of personified peak roaring 20s, right? Courageous, individual, adventurer, crosses the Atlantic, establishes a new um, sort of world record, um, and he's sort of young and, and shy and, and self-effacing, uh, and people just love him. Um, and he becomes this, you know, global celebrity. He, he, when he flies into Mexico City on a goodwill tour about six months after he flies to France, 150,000 people show up at the airport to greet him in Mexico City. So he was a global figure. And then, of course, five years later, his baby's kidnapped, the crime of the century, his family is subjected to these horrific tabloid uh, reporters who take pictures of his dead baby and hound him and his wife and climb up on ladders to get pictures into their house. Um, and it really, uh, it, it, it drove him out of the country. He moved to Europe because it was so horrific. So who made money from selling all these newspapers from all this scandalous uh, yellow journalism coverage? This new kind of robber baron, a media tycoon, the media mogul, William Randolph Hearst. Um, and he understood the power of the least common denominator, right? Uh, he, he, there were other big publishers, Pulitzer and Scripps, and, but, but Hearst had a unique sense of what people wanted, and he gave it to them. Um, he started construction of uh, San Simeon in California. This is uh, the Hearst Castle. Have any of you been there? Everybody been to Hearst Castle? It's unbelievable, right? I mean, he just traveled through Europe and he would buy a church so he could have the wall on one side. Or, or he would buy an old monastery and take the ceiling out of one of the rooms and just ship it over back to the United States. Uh, even after he built San Simeon, he had a 40,000 square foot warehouse in Manhattan just filled with crates of stuff he'd bought that he never used. So by 1925, um, he's living in uh, Hearst Castle with his uh, mistress. Um, uh, what's her name? Marion Davies. There we go. You got, you got to my page faster than I did. Sorry. Uh, and uh, the Simeon became the sort of mecca for the ultimate haves. This, this isn't the 1%. This is the one-tenth, maybe the one-fiftieth of 1% uh, that could get an invitation to Hearst Castle. Uh, so Hollywood celebrities, obviously, he was very involved in Hollywood. Was here you see Clark Gable and um, Carol Lombard. Does anybody recognize the guy with the mustache and hat? I couldn't figure out who he is. Does anybody know Hollywood celebrities of that period? I could not figure. I I, search, I did a Google search for his face, but between the mustache and the hat, yeah, Bozo the Clown came up. Um, and then you had Charlie Chaplin, Cary Grant, the Marx Brothers. All these people would come out to his San Simeon for these. Um, Weekends of debauchery. Uh, even I want to be alone. Greta Garbo, who was notoriously uh, um, shy and publicity averse, even she went out um, to spend time with William Randolph Hearst. But Hollywood eventually turned on Hearst um, and his strange obsessions with the great director Orson Welles' film Citizen Kane. Now, this is much later, this is the late 30s. Um, but the film sort of mocks this obsession with obscene wealth. Uh, and again, it reflects this transition that happens as we approach World War II. But back to the 1920s. Um, so there's this profound shift in wealth. You can see this graph. You know, so the first wealth, the first peak you see there on the left is the Gilded Age. And then you see that peak uh, in the, in the mid-1920s. Uh, so this is the... Um, the total share of wealth by the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of U.S. Um, families. So, you know, they're, they're a quarter of it is being owned by a tenth of 1% of, of the U.S. families. Um, so it's, it's this sort of staggering, and you see how quickly that rises during this period. Um, and it, it wasn't just uh, their um, net worth. 70% of the gains in income during this period, because it was a period of great prosperity. If you see the graph on the left, so the gray, that's the percentage of income growth captured by 1%. 70% of the income growth went to the 1%. Um, 
And then you can see uh, there's some years missing in here, you know, 1960 to, to 1979, the bottom 90% is getting most of the economic growth. And then you start seeing after Reagan becomes president that that shifts back to where it was during the growing 20s and the Gilded Age where all of a sudden all the economic growth goes to the top 1%. So Henry Ford is a great example of this. Um, the difference between the haves and the have-nots during this period. Henry Ford reported a personal income of $14 million in the same year that the average personal income was $750. So by present day standards, uh, if you say the year, average yearly income in the U.S. is about $40,000, Mr. Ford would be making $530 million a year. $530 million a year. Can you hear me? So this grossly unequal distribution of wealth really starts to undermine the, the social fabric. Um, no group fell faster from abundance to bust than farmers. Um, as I said before, when World War I ended and the, price, the bottom fell out of the price for food and for agricultural stocks, the farmers were left holding these farms and ha having debts that they had to pay off. And of course, again, they, pr out, they plowed up the prairie. And so if you stop planting the prairie, it becomes dust and then the wind comes and you have all sorts of problems. So these farmers started something called the, Pe the Populist Party, and tens of thousands of them would show up for these protests. Again, this is still the Roaring Twenties. This isn't the Depression yet. Um, and they were demanding, you know, that put, the government put more money in circulation, that uh, they have to, the government had to give assistance to farmers for their loans. They had to uh, reduce tariffs, which were hurting them. They had to create a graduated income tax. A lot of these things sound familiar because FDR did them all 20 years later. But... So the farmers now were the beginning. They are the canary in the coal mine about the Great Depression. Because without a successful and, and a stable agrarian economy, America doesn't work. Black farmers were particularly uh, hurt by the economic changes. Um, many of them, again, were tenant farmers or sharecroppers. They didn't own the property. So when things went bad, they just got kicked off. You know, and they had no place to go. Uh, black Americans also had to deal with the rise of the KKK. So the 1920s is the peak power for the KKK in this country. You know, if you think about the movies, you know, that, that, that come out, you think about uh, the, their huge parades down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. You think about the fact that they had the control of state legislatures in more than a dozen southern states. They really were in control of a large part of America. And so black Americans were really fearful for their lives if they criticized the political structure. This is when poll taxes and they lost all their voting rights. This was a very difficult period for them. And out West, even migrant Mexican workers, the conditions got so bad that they started moving back. There was a enormous net outflow of, of migrant Mexican workers during this period because there wasn't enough work for them on the farms, particularly out in California. So you had labor strikes, you had rising racial tensions, you had activist farmers, you had the militant unemployed, um, and th all of these things were sort of bubbling up beneath the surface of the flappers and you know party and everything is great and the stock market is going through the roof. So you have this real disconnect between these two worlds, which are in fact about to collide. So in 1928, FDR returns to the political scene. He runs for governor in New York. That's Al Smith next to him. Al Smith was the governor of New York. He ran for president. He lost. Democrats got shellacked all across the country, but FDR won. Um, and again, this was this sort of bellwether of what's about to happen. Um, Smith thought that because FDR uh, had polio and was sort of uh, had a disability that you know, Al Smith was just going to be the governor, you know, behind the scenes, and FDR would just be a figurehead. And FDR, basically, Al Smith shows up at his office with a speech he wants FDR to give, uh, and FDR says, thank you very much, I've written my own speech, there's the door. Um, and Al Smith becomes a implacable foe of FDR. They had been close allies up to this point, and spends most of the rest of his career trying to tear down Franklin Roosevelt. 
So Herbert Hoover moves into the White House when FDR moves into the governor's mansion at, at Albany. And again, remember, everything's great. You know, everything is great um, until it's not. Uh, so eight months after uh, Hoover is inaugurated, the Wall Street uh, collapse happens, and uh, Hoover and the Republicans have they have no answers. They don't know what to do. None of the usual tricks work, um, and they just had a real um, hard time getting away from their mindset, which is that well, it's worked in the past, so we're just going to let industry and the bankers do what they want, and eventually it'll come around, and you know the churches and the charities will take care of the poor people. That's that's not our job. Um, so this was the greatest economic collapse in American history, and this is one of the few times when the haves suffered just as much as the have-nots. I'm going to go back to this graphic here, so you can see this collapse that happens in 1929, right before that, 1933, and how dramatically it drops down all the way into the middle of World War II. Um, and this is a period where the stock market lost, you know, 89% of its value. Um, and the unions and the working class, particularly under Roosevelt, sort of were given new power and authority. And so you get this much more level playing field uh, in terms of the percentage of wealth held by the very rich versus that held by the rest of the country. Um, so the stockbrokers were broke. Um, and this cartoon sort of shows this um, sense that the old system has totally collapsed. Now, what are we going to do? Unemployment skyrockets to 25% by 1932. Remember, back then, most families, there was a single breadwinner. It wasn't like, you know, husband loses his job, the wife keeps working. You know, this was catastrophic for most families. Um, with millions of people out of work, nobody would pay the rent, people get kicked out of their homes. Um, there's no social security, there's no safety net. Um, the prices for food plummeted. Banks were closed on thousands of farms. No one would buy the farms. The banks lost money when the people went to the banks to get their money. Banks didn't have any money. People lined up, banks were forced to close. It becomes this vicious cycle, right? The bank forecloses on your, you have no money, the bank forecloses on your farm. Then the people come to the bank to get their money out. The bank doesn't have the money. The bank forecloses. Now nobody has money. This period, there is no safety net. The Great Depression caused a level of poverty and homelessness that's hard for us to understand today. There was no food stamps. There were no homeless shelters. Um, you know, many people were forced to move into these Hoovervilles. Um, which are these little shanty? This is this is Central Park in New York. Um, these little shanties that they would build. Um, so, in 1932, with the the United States population of 125 million people, there were two million people who were homeless. That's that's what they could count. Two million people were homeless. That doesn't count the people that were living with their parents or living with their brother or ten to a room. Two million people. So today, the population of you know, 330 million, the estimate is that there's about 600,000 unhoused people in this country. That, that number is disputed by some, but you can get a sense, you know. So today, at the level of homelessness that they had back then, you're talking six to eight million people on the streets. I love, I love this picture. Um, you know, despite pleas that for help from Hoover, you know, uh, Hoover's Poor Farm Tobacco Fund and Hard times are still hoovering over us. Um, but again, Hoover couldn't bring himself to do um, anything to help the individual. He just didn't think the federal government's job. He launched a couple of sort of work programs, and they were trying to do some things. And actually, a couple of the policies that he was trying to get um, passed uh, you know, between the FDR's election and FDR's inauguration were things that the, the Roosevelt team actually uh, put into effect after Roosevelt became president, but the country had just turned on him. So I love this cartoon. Uh, I just found this recently. This is March 3rd, 1933, the day before FDR is inaugurated. And if you can't read it, you see he's taking out Hoover's trash, 
Um, it says, uh, prosperity is around the corner. These are all uh, campaign slogans from Hoover, by the way. Um, chicken in every pot, a car in every garage. Um, you know, so this is this idea that, and you can see Hoover sort of stomping off in the background. This is, this is the public perception at this moment, which is that Hoover failed, FDR's coming in with new ideas, we're gonna try something new, the New Deal, which is what he, of course, ran on. Last slide. Um, and so he was elected on this pledge uh, to do something for the American people because he believed it was the government's job to help the individual, right? He didn't think it was the job just for the American government just to help big business and Wall Street, but that it was his job to help the American people when they needed it. Um, and so he instituted all of these changes in the government. And why was he able to essentially radically change the American government in a fairly short period of time? Well, because you know most of the Republicans were voted out. He had super majorities in the House and the Senate. And everybody who was in the House and the Senate, even the Republicans, wanted to do something because the situation was desperate. You're now three plus years into the Great Depression. Um, and people knew that the old system wasn't working. Um, so that's for another program. <clears throat> but the last thing I'll say is FDR doesn't get to be in that moment in time when Republicans and Democrats agree we need fundamental change in the American way the American government works and the American people are demanding it and you have a person with both the savvy and the intelligence and the empathy and the wife necessary to make those changes. Um, and that's why in 1934, 1933, you see the implementation of all these New Deal policies which shifted the focus of the federal government from big business to the average Joe. All right, well, I'll take any questions you might have. All right, folks, so if you are at home, you can type your question into the chat and I will read it for you. For folks in the room, we need you to speak into the mic so the folks at home can hear what your question is. And there are at least two hands up over here. So I'm gonna come around this way. By the way, that was 90 slides I went through in 50 minutes. So a new record, a new record. What were the churches and the other societies that were supposed to help these people, which is what they, we were told, were doing at the time of the Depression. Everything in their power. Um, again, you have, you have to remember that this, it starts, you know, the, the idea that there are soup kitchens and things like that, it, it starts actually prior to uh, Black Friday, October 1929. Because like I said, there was, you know, the, Canary in the coal mine had been singing for a while that there are a lot of people in America that are hurting, particularly in rural areas. And so churches, and you know, back then, 90% of Americans identified as Christian and went to a church on a regular basis. So they all had that sort of expectation of a framework of support. But the churches can only do so much. You know, right? The church requires pass the collection plate. When everybody in the room is broke, they're not putting money in the collection plate. When there's only a small number of families who are struggling, the church can support them. When every member of the church is struggling, the church can't do it. And so charities like the Red Cross and all these other charities that have been established that have been successful for years, it, they find the same thing. An organization that's set up to support maybe 100 people, say, all of a sudden there's 10,000 people outside their front door begging for food. You know, that picture, of the, of the soup kitchen, you know, they were, people were lining up, they were desperate to have a bowl of soup, which would be the only thing they would eat that day. Um, and that, you know, the churches and the charities, they just couldn't, they, they couldn't do it. It was too big a job. And this is again, where I think there was this blind spot with the people who had been in government for a long time, which was that, yeah, it's bad right now, but it's gonna get better, right? This is just a dip, you know, it'll come back and the market will correct and everything will be fine. But of course it didn't, it got worse and worse and worse. So, you know, October 29 isn't the bottom. You know, the, you don't hit the bottom until March of 33 when you really have the complete collapse of the US banking system. So this goes on and on and on and the charities and the churches, there's literally only so much they can do. 
There was another question. Uh, thank you. This is a re really remarkable overview, Paul. Um, you know, of course, 1934 seems like a new morning, but <clears throat> there's a big cloud in the sky that is between 1900 and 1936, 37, the Supreme Court is declaring all progressive legislation, whether or not it comes from the states or from the federal government, unconstitutional. So the big threat he has now is now that he's won the presidency is the Supreme Court. Can you say a few things about that? Yeah, he hated the Supreme Court. Um, and, uh, you know, he, as you all know, he tried to pack it. You know, he said, okay, for everybody, every Supreme Court justice that's over the age of 70, um, they're getting a little old. We're going to appoint another Supreme Court justice to help them. So we would have appointed five more Supreme Court justices if he had gotten away with his court packing. But even his closest allies in Congress basically said, no, DOA, you're never, you're never going to do that. It's not going to happen. And so the pressure that FDR was putting on the Supreme Court and the public pressure. I mean, Supreme Court may be sort of an ivory tower type of organization, but when people are dying in the streets, even they take notice. And the stitch in time, the switch in time that saved nine, right, was the idea that one of the key conservative members switched his vote, another one dropped out. And so FDR appointed no Supreme Court justices in his first term. But in his second and third term, he appointed eight. So he had the last laugh. Um, but yes, it was the Supreme Court started overturning his New Deal legislation as early as uh, uh, 1935, uh, and then overturned a series of them. And the big one was whether they were going to uphold Social Security. Um, and they did. They didn't overturn Social Security, which became essentially a turning point in their um, hesitancy to overturn legislation that is so obviously desperately needed, even though it, it went against their political beliefs. Um, you know, the nine old men, there was actually a cartoon I wanted to put in uh, about the Supreme Court. Um, but in the end, again, he was able to get a Supreme Court that um, he thought was going to get along very well. It turned out they all hated each other and fought like cats and dogs. But that's, that's for a different program. So we have some over here. Could you introduce them a little bit about the Brain Trust and Francis Perkins? Sure. So the when FDR becomes governor of New York, again, he's he's elected before depression hits. Um, but he puts, you know, one of the, one of FDR's great strengths, in my opinion, was his ability to see talent in people um, and to put them in positions in which they could succeed and help him. Uh, he often would put two people in essentially the same position and make them fight it out. But um, he started putting together a team uh, when actually some of them date back all the way to when he ran for governor. I mean, went, ran for vice president in 1920. But for the, the gubernatorial race, Francis Perkins, you know, who was the labor head of the labor commission in New York. I can't remember what the organization was. And of course, Francis Perkins goes on to write the Social Security Act. And one of the people that serves all 12 years of the administration. Harry Hopkins comes in at this point. Uh, Judge Sam Rosenman comes in at this point. Uh, a number of people um, that are um, sort of part of his inner circle. But then as governor, once the um, economy really starts going bad, he says, OK, we need to pull together academics to help us figure out what's going on. here." He turns to a man named Raymond Moley, uh, who's an academic at Columbia, I think, um, and says, OK, bring some of the smartest people you know about economics and, and bring them to me. I don't want political advisors. I want academics. And so they bring this group together, Tugwell, Rex Tugwell, and Adolf Burley, and a couple of other people that sort of come together. And they have these sessions at the governor's mansion where they would come, and they would have a nice dinner, and they'd start drinking. And then basically, Roosevelt would interrogate them um, about what do you do about unemployment? What do you do about this? What do you do about that? And FDR, despite the fact that he was a book collector, and didn't really like to read briefing papers. He didn't like you to write, you know, if you wrote him a 20-page briefing paper that outlined everything he asked you about, he wouldn't read it. He would say, okay, tell me, explain it to me. And he would want people to explain things to him. And he, several people described it as like osmosis. 
as they would talk to him, he would comprehend what they were saying, even things they hadn't said yet, and sort of understand what they were talking about faster than they could explain it to him. Uh, and so these, th this brain trust, which men, many of whom ended up going with him to Washington, were critical in giving him new ideas about how to approach this unprecedented economic crisis. Um, and they were called the Brains Trust, um, and they were sort of made fun of on some level, but all of them were really quite brilliant people um, in their own way. And FDR had, you know, no agenda in trying to prove that his ideas were right. He didn't care. He just, what's going to work? And one of his, you know, famous philosophies was try something. If it doesn't work, try something else, but find something that works and then do that. Um, so I think the Brains Trust was the beginning of this way where he opened himself up to outside ideas and then surrounded himself with really smart people, even if they didn't like each other, um, to help him solve the problems that were facing America. There's a great book about them, by the way. Paul, uh, thank you for bringing history alive to us. But I want to ask you to jump about a century. What would you say about the present class of Silicon Valley robber barons and how they're affecting or not affecting society? I think you're seeing a, 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 an almost line for line repeat of the Gilded Age um, and for the same reasons. You know, a lot of the reasons these people became fabulously wealthy was that you had this fundamental technological change across multiple industries. The whole nature of oil, how you got oil out of the ground and then what you did with it, how you moved a box from New York to Chicago changed, right? You know, you're no longer putting it on a boat going through a canal being pulled by a horse. All of a sudden you're on a train going 50 miles an hour. Um, the idea of how you communicate with people, radios, you know, instantaneous communication. The idea that you could create banks um, that would have enormous lending power so much so that the banks in many ways could control the industries that they were investing in. Um, so th the nature of the initial Gilded Age was that these people took advantage, often ruthlessly, of these new developments, would crush the competition, consolidate their holdings, and become so powerful that no one could compete against them. And I think you're seeing exactly the same thing today. Look at Apple, look at Amazon, look at Facebook, you know, look at these big companies um, that had unique, brilliant visionaries as leaders, but had a unique niche that, which they exploited. Um, and that in almost all of those cases, the reason they became so fabulously wealthy was that they were ruthless in, in either buying and absorbing their competitors or destroying them, right? Um, and I think this parallel between this enormous growth of the very top 1% in this country. You saw the graph, right? It went like this in the Gilded Age, it went like this, and then it went like this because the rules started changing again to favor the very wealthy. You know, if you look at that graph, why does it suddenly go up after Reagan? So you know what the top tax bracket was under the staunch Republican Ike Eisenhower? 90%, right? So. The idea was that for a long time in there, there was um, some would call it a punitive, you know, tax, you know, pro tax rate, but that the, the wealthier you got, the more you paid. And then after 1980, you start to see a change in that, which was that the top rate comes down, comes down, comes down. Uh, the bottom rate of tax rate stays the same, but wages stay flat as wealth goes up for the very wealthy. So you get this growth that's building, um, and you see this um, idea that, okay, I create a company, you know, I have a $100 million worth of stock, that stock goes up by another $100 million, so I made $100 million this year, but I don't pay a penny on it unless I sell it, right? And so that idea of accumulated wealth, you know, which is one of the things that ended the British aristocracy, right, was that they taxed the wealth you know, which is why all those people doubt Abbey had to sell their houses, right? So in America never did that. And so you see an incredible disparity in wealth in this country that you don't see in many other developing countries because they didn't abandon that idea of a high top tax rate for the very wealthy. And by the way, a lot of Democrats supported 
you know, it's easy to blame Reagan, but a lot of Democrats supported that. And of course, you know, Clinton and Gore are the ones who passed the Telecommunications Act, which took the internet, totally funded by your tax dollars and developed by the military, and just gave it away. I mean, imagine if the government still controlled the internet. There we go, another question over here. Oh, one in the back, right behind you. I note that um, in the pictures of soup lines that you see, overwhelmingly it's men waiting in line. And that's always troubled me as to what, how women survived. Is it media bias that just wanted to portray all these breadwinners out of work? Were there women actually accessing this publicly available food? Or how, how did they survive? It's a, it's a great question that I don't have a d definitive answer to. Um, I think it was dangerous for women to go out on the streets, you know, at that point. I think a lot of men would try to get food and bring them home to their families. Um, and that there was um, such a stigma about this. It was so embarrassing that a lot of these men who are on soup lines, you know, are homeless. You know, they're living on the street. Uh, I think a lot of the women and children were able to find, you know, family members or people that they could go live with. But a lot of them, you see, you're right about the soup lines. It usually looks like men in the soup lines. But if you look at the Hoovervilles and the shanty towns, it's mostly women and children. So there, there, there's some kind of split there that I don't fully understand. Um, but I, I have noticed that it, you know, it's usually you see men in those lines. That may also be, you know, a function of, you know, the time and place and, and where those photographs are being taken. I have time for one more question? No? Okay, I will tell you next week, next month, it's going to be a humdinger. The, so the, the Masters of the Air, you know, that's the news TV series it's on, which is very good. It's based on this book, Masters of the Air, about the 8th Air Force. But, you know, my presentation is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be you know, a little bit about the politics behind the air war um, because the British and the Americans had radically different, you know, strategies about bombing and Churchill and FDR had radically different strategies about it and they all fought like crazy. You can probably tell I love it when there's conflict. Um, and, and it's some of the most horrific war crimes committed during World War II were by these air forces bombing, I'm gonna focus primarily on Europe, but also in the Pacific, in Japan. You know, the fire bombings, the deliberate fire bombings of these cities is mind boggling in, in what, um, what they did, why they did it, the rationale uh, and the bombers crews and the terrible, terrible casualties they suffered. So it's a very interesting story. Um, it's for the World War II buffs, you know, I'll give you lots of hardware, but it's it's really a sociological issue because all of the same issues that came up in World War II about civilian bombing, you know, still with us today. What is happening in Israel, right? What happened in the Vietnam War? What happened in the Korea War? You know, you're seeing what's happening in Ukraine right now. You know, these are deliberately targeting civilian populations for terror, for the, re, for the purpose of terrorizing. And I think there's... It's not a great lesson to be learned, but it's certainly uh, a useful lens to look at what's continuing to happen today and why this becomes sort of the default and somehow acceptable military strategy to bomb innocent civilians. Um, so uh, it'll be a good one. All right.